So we were uh, basically talking about uh, displaced aggression when we met last. So today we'll uh, now continue with that. Uh, our focus now is to go towards that end of uh, aggressive behavior, uh, which uh, invites the intervention of the experts, uh, which invites uh, the individual who is actually displaying aggression in that form uh, to get into touch with people who specializes uh, in certain form of uh, uh, maladaptive behavior handling so that he or she can get uh, some, some benefit out of their expertise. Uh, basically, what we had done was that we had uh, been talking about uh, uh, how an individual becomes aggressive, what, are, what could be the strong correlates of aggression, uh, what in fact uh, you know, uh, triggers aggression, how it can become um, uh, very brutal. We took a long spectrum and now we are going towards the end of uh, that end of uh, the spectrum of aggressive behavior, uh, where the behavior is not considered to be normal. Okay, that form of aggression is not considered to be normal. We will uh, debate at uh, two points, because uh, <coughs> certain form of aggressive behavior you would realize uh, that although clinically it is considered to be a pathological form of aggressive behavior, but somehow culturally it is still accepted. Culturally people do not consider that to be an act of uh, pathological aggression. Okay. So that also we will debate. So uh, last time we had talked about the displaced aggression, uh, just I thought I will once again uh, begin with it, because here you find uh, the reference of uh, bullying, uh, finding a scapegoat, finding a weaker member of your own community whom you can thrash. Okay. And in psychology you will find whole lot of uh, literature on bullying behavior. Okay. Today what we are uh, uh, trying to primarily do is to look at the pathological form of aggressive behavior. And here also we will move gradually, you remember our uh, uh, first module where we had uh, know started with uh, a normal set of behavior and then we had come to borderline defenses and from borderline defenses we went to a pathological form of behavior. Here also we will exactly do the same, till now we have talked about uh, the normal form of aggressive behavior. We would now be talking about the borderline uh, cases of uh, aggressive behavior and where it takes a turn where it becomes pathological. Now aggression is also considered to be an outcome of a compensatory behavior okay, or reaction formation. Uh, you remember we had talked about compensation, we had talked about uh, reaction formation when we were talking about uh, defense mechanisms. No? You remember task oriented reaction patterns, defense oriented reaction pattern. Okay. There we had talked about it. Uh, if you look at the compensatory behavior, okay, it, it is usually of two types. No? One is that there could be a compensation in kind okay, or there is another uh, form of compensatory behavior what is called as uh, compensation by substitute. Okay. Now what happens in the case of uh, compensation in kind, one has an unusual drive okay, which finally makes him or her achieve in the area where the shortcoming lies. Okay. So I as an individual realizes my deficiency okay, and put excessive effort okay, in order to overcome it. Now why uh, it is called compensation is that usually uh, say it is something like uh, you have a small pit in the ground and you are told to fill it. The moment you realize that uh, you know, your lawn has a small pit. Okay, and say you dig out much more uh, of uh, mud to compensate for it, fill the gap. Okay. What you finally do is far more compared to what was actually needed. Okay. So compensation in kind refers to that type of thing. Usually what happens in the normal situation, uh, you will be told that uh, say uh, you are deficient of certain score, say for example. 
say uh, you are in your school days and the report of uh, one of the test comes which suggests that you are weak at mathematics for example. Okay. The moment you realize that I am weaker in my numerical abilities all you do is that you will put more effort parents will look at it uh, they will try to make you more uh, make more effort in that area maybe you are given a, a private tutorship in order to fill that gap. But it is not that uh, say you start only and only working in the area of mathematics because you want to fill the gap that does not happen. So, that is a normal way of uh, handling deficiencies, but in compensatory behavior what happens you realize the gap okay, the deficiency and you try to compensate for it and that compensation usually is very very you know vigorous type of an attempt. Okay. So, it would be something like you know majority of your time that you devote for academic activities is dedicated only to numerical abilities. So, that is uh, no compensation in kind. Okay. So, it basically is an intensification of something which is otherwise considered to be normal. Okay. So, when you try to know come forward with a mechanism which will help you overcome the problem the shortcoming that you are experiencing it is a normal behavior when you make it excessively intense okay it becomes compensation in kind usually uh, people who are you know trying to compensate for a deficiency that they have realized you would realize that if you touch them on that issue they suddenly become very aggressive okay uh, now, we come to compensation by substitute this is a different mechanism here also you realize a deficiency, okay. but then you know that it is beyond my purview no I cannot handle it. So, what you do is that you develop ability okay, of some other kind to compensate for what you do not have. Okay. Now, usually take the same example in your school days you get your uh, test results and you realize that uh, you are extremely uh, you have done extremely bad at uh, mathematics. Okay. The very realization that you have been uh, under performer uh, in your mathematics test makes you recall that over last couple of years since class 5th or 6th you have been uh, not terribly performing in your uh, mathematics test. Okay. Or later on you realize that I am even uh, know bad at uh, physics, I have difficulty memorizing all those long long reactions, so I cannot do well in my chemistry tests. Okay. But then you realize uh, that uh, somehow you play hockey very well, you play football very well, you play cricket very well. Okay. And then comes the uh, know situation where you start realizing that I am excellent and at something, uh, but I have been consistently poor at something. Okay. Compensation by substitute would be that you use the skill that you have you maximize it, so that it can compensate for the loss that it is being incurred. Okay. So, I know that I cannot do good at uh, my numerical things and therefore, I compensate it by becoming the best player of the my uh, school team. Okay, I realize uh, that my uh, school does not have a choice, but to keep uh, me you know uh, holding with themselves. Okay, in most of the schools you would realize that uh, you have a set of students who are academically weak, the school would have otherwise not entertained them in, uh, in their school, but still they take pride in doing that, because these are the students who are very good at track and field events uh, at sports okay, and they bring uh, all those laurels to the school and therefore, they are still retained. In jobs in most of the institutions of higher education you find certain seats which are reserved for students who have been exceptional players in their school days. Okay. So, you realize that there is a possibility that if I do not have an ability and my all my best effort still cannot make me compensate for it. Let me know 
extra achieve in areas where I am very good, where I am excellent okay. and this is compensation by substitute. Okay. Now, this is a, a common means of adjustment to failure and frustration, I have failed in something, there is something has been a great source of frustration for me and then I try to compensate it. Okay. And compensatory behavior usually boosts your ego and it positively affects your self esteem. So, if you are successful in terms of compensating the deficiency that you had realized, okay, it further uh, you know, adds to your ego strength, your self esteem increases and that means that overall uh, you are far more stable, far more happier. Okay. <coughs> Compensation as a mechanism Okay, has nothing wrong in it. Okay. The reason why we are discussing compensation in kind and compensation by substitute is uh, that there is certain degree of frustration and aggression which is attached to the compensatory behavior. Okay. So, as I told you uh, sometime back that in compensation in kind because you put much much extra effort in uh, you know, trying to plug in the deficiency that you have realized. Okay. What happens is that uh, the moment you are touched upon the softer issue, the issue of deficiency or the extra effort that you are making, it makes you aggressive. Okay. Similarly, if you are trying to compensate by uh, substitute, you would ensure that nobody should point finger to the area of your original deficiency. Everybody should point uh, finger at the area where you have developed that strength and you have achieved. Okay. The moment somebody points finger towards the original area of deficiency, it perturbs you, it makes you very aggressive okay. and this is how uh, this compensatory mechanism fuels aggressive behavior. But as such this behavior is not considered to be pathological unless uh, you take a certain attempts which does not make you pathological, but can uh, know make others realize that you are perhaps doing something which otherwise you should not have done. Uh, very uh, recently last week when we had this uh, medicine research, there was a news of a uh, uh, women uh, volleyball player from uh, Lucknow. Uh, she lost one of her uh, foot some time back. So, he was a national level player of uh, volleyball, uh, well known player and some, some something took place uh, in the train and she was thrown out of the running train and finally, one of her foot was imputed. So, this means that she can no more play volleyball. The reason I am quoting her example is that last week there was a news saying uh, that she has taken training in mountaineering and this week. Uh, perhaps uh, she will be making an attempt to climb Mount Everest. Okay. You realize your deficiency, one of your foot is amputed and you realize that you can no more uh, be seen in uh, the field of the court of uh, volleyball. So, you decide of going to another height where usually people who are otherwise able who have two good working uh, feet even they cannot uh, climb you decide to climb with the help of one artificial limb. This is a form of compensatory behavior. Okay. I know of somebody uh, who has uh, the clubbed fit, you, know, you have seen the fit people uh, instead of our foot are like this, you know, but some people have fit like this. You know. So, he had this clubbed fit and, that's, and that too uh, his uh, toe was somehow like this. You know. So, this means half of uh, the fit will basically bear the whole body weight and in certain uh, months of the year when you have uh, you know, reduced level of uh, moisture in the air, when he would walk for long because of the dry skin and because the whole body weight was on that part of uh, the fit, the skin of the fit will crack. I have seen it myself. No. It used to crack and it would not be a profuse bleeding, but some amount of blood at times used to come, but otherwise it would hurt because the skin would crack even though it is not bleeding it, it used to hurt him. 
and uh, because we do not have shoes for people like this. So, he was forced only and only to be a sleeper and I have seen him he was very active, uh, he was the one who would go to the field very frequently meet the clients to all type of staffs very active and would ensure that uh, no he walks where rest all others walk. Okay. He was always given the choice that why do not you, you know uh, take a scooter somebody who is on a scooter or a bike okay, why do not you sit at the back and he or she can make you reach that point and he will always ensure that no 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 I will walk. Okay. He will have cracks in the evening uh, his wound would, would, would hurt like anything he would apply ointments and all those things but he would ensure that I would walk. Okay. These are compensatory mechanisms, I know of uh, another interesting per person a uh, very well known person uh, who was uh, at one of the one of the famous institutes in our country, uh, he was a faculty there and uh, at some point in time uh, during the process of negotiation for uh, marriage he was made to realize that uh, you do not have the wealth of my proportion and therefore, you should not have even thought of coming to our house for a relationship. Uh, the reason was that uh, he was somebody in the teaching capacity and had uh, gone to a groom's place probable groom's place. Uh, who was from a very very affluent family, very rich family all those into uh, trades you know, diamond trade and stuffs like this. And uh, after this episode within a very short span of time he decided to leave India, he went abroad again remained in the same profession, but went abroad and uh, I am told. I have not heard from the primary source, I have heard from the secondary source uh, that several years later he came back, went to the same person whom he had initially gone to for negotiating marriage. He went there with his passbook and he said that now I have left this country, I am there and this is my passbook. Uh, I would not ask you how much you have in your bank account, but now you can see my bank account. These are you know different types of stories, you will hear you know hundreds and hundreds of such stories, where you would realize that see at the surface it looks simply like an action of compensation. Okay. But imagine somebody who has a child of a marriageable age would have crossed certain age you know, and at that time at that point in your life you decide to leave a country go to a place where, where the exchange rate will certainly be you know uh, much much higher for compared to your own currency. You go earn like anything, so how much uh, know agitated that person would have been within okay, that I have to achieve this target okay. and how and this entire uh, know uh, the boiling within would have continued that finally made him uh, know come back after certain number of years, go to the same house meet the same person and say this is my passbook no, you, you, you may like to uh, have a look at it no. And these are the you know, things which makes compensatory reaction okay, fuel aggressive behavior like anything you no, know, you keep on keep on boiling within. In fact, the last part of uh, this very uh, module uh, today when we come to, to the end the last slide would have something where you would see that uh, finally, aggression is inflicted on the individual. No? So, I myself become the source of my own anger, okay, I become a victim of my own anger we will come to that also. Now, over aggressive behavior might be a reaction to fear it is quite possible. Okay that one is experiencing or the anticipation of fearful situation might also trigger over aggressive behavior. Okay. Usually you would realize that uh, people who are uh, caught in certain type of situations, uh, you remember the movie titanic, uh, when uh, these safety boats were supposed to be uh, sent to the uh, sea, there was a security guard 
who had initially opened fire you remember that sequence okay now when you have situation like that where you realize that situation is of an exceptional nature okay where life and death runs parallel and you don't know which step will lead you to what okay when you realize that things are beyond your control and you anyhow you have to struggle your uh, best to hold the situation okay those are the time when you would realize that many people become extremely aggressive in nature okay uh, this guard on the titanic in that episode shows that type of a behavior uh, you uh, i'm sure none of you have met people uh, who have experienced communal violence okay uh, if you get a chance if you talk to them they will tell you okay what finally made them do what they did okay so you would realize that uh, you know when you experience the fear that your survival is at stake okay the survival of your near and dear ones are at stake then you realize that most of us were turned extremely aggressive okay now this is basically a situation of reaction formation ideally you are extremely scared okay and you should remain scared but in turn you become aggressive okay you remember when we were talking about defense mechanism we had talked about reaction formation that inwardly you feel something else and outwardly you express it in a different form okay now such type of reactions basically are considered to be the borderline cases okay that now your aggression might any time cross the limit of the clinical acceptance limit of aggressive behavior okay inability to control one's impulse of course we see this also in people and which is otherwise considered to be a disorder that if you repeatedly realize that you are unable to contain your anger okay then this inability might be actually a form of disorder we will come to that if you look at uh, the whole description of uh, uh, psychiatric disorders different type of uh, behavioral problems uh, given by the american psychiatric association which is uh, considered to be the bible for clinical diagnosis no it's called diagnostic and statistical manual okay dsm popularly it's called dsm the version that is available right now which is being used worldwide is dsm 4 tr tr is text revision okay so fourth uh, edition of dsm the fifth uh, edition of uh, dsm will uh, very shortly it will come okay and uh, there are interesting ways know how uh, these committees are constituted you would be very amused to know you know that for small of uh, behavioral problem or psychiatric disorder there would be a very big team okay of the experts who have been working in that area okay and they choose experts from uh, around the world okay so say for example uh, say ang uh, panic anxiety for example okay so for panic anxiety there would be a whole board okay those would work for years would know look at all types of uh, behavioral uh, uh, symptoms that has been reported to clinics across the world they will compile them do all types of things and finally come with a diagnostic criteria right now we will come to some other diagnostic criteria okay now many psychiatric disorders such as antisocial personality disorder for example there is something called conduct disorder substance related disorder where you go for uh, abusing substances mood disorder okay they all include certain degree of inability to control your impulse those who have strong urges for abuse of substances okay this also reflects certain degree of inability to control your uh, desire your impulse okay but then american psychiatric association has put another category okay named impulse control disorders okay and this includes you know many many types of uh, problems uh, such as intermittent explosive disorder kleptomania pyromania pathological gambling uh, trichotillomania and impulse control disorder which is not otherwise classified now these are classified disorders okay there could be impulse control situations 
uh, where it has not been classified into these categories. What we will do is uh, that we will uh, know look at each of them and then the first three we will uh, further go into the details of it looking at the diagnostic criteria for it. Intermittent explosive disorder basically reflects the inability of an individual to resist aggressive impulse that results into serious assault or damage of property. Okay. So, you have that inner impulse which you realize that you are unable to control and finally, what it results into is a serious assault to somebody. Okay. Uh, no, you apply punches here and there at the softer parts of the body, make the person profusely bleed or uh, all types of uh, no, deformity that can take place or you commit extreme damage to the property of the individual. Okay. And all this is guided by basically your uh, inability to not having the uh, uh, your inability to control your impulse. Okay you have that impulse and suddenly it gets converted into action. And definitely uh, from a social view point if you look at it, it is a disproportionate reflection of your anger. Okay. Uh, somebody say for example, uh, who commits an error of a lower magnitude usually even in the court of law you would realize that the punishment, the quantum of punishment is also lower. So, usually uh, more and more uh, grave is the more and more severe is the nature of crime that you have committed, uh, no, more and more intense becomes the uh, quantum of punishment. Okay. But in the case of intermittent explosive disorder irrespective of the severity of the problem, the quantum of the punishment maximizes. Okay. Then comes uh, kleptomania, this is a very interesting type of uh, problem where one shows inability to contain the desire that impulse of a stealing objects. Okay. Uh, remember this is difference, uh, this is completely different from theft and robbery. Okay. Here what happens, you steal objects which you are not going to use personally and you are not even going to use that object for monetary benefit. Monetary benefit means uh, that you steal an object you do not use it yourself rather you sell it in the market okay, and derive monetary benefit out of it. Kleptomania is completely different, no, you steal things which you are not going to use, which you are not going to sell and uh, make a monetary benefit, but you have that inner urge to steal those objects and you take pride in doing that. Okay. I do not know if you are aware of uh, a uh, very famous um, actress of Hindi cinema of yester years, okay, who had uh, this kleptomanic tendency of stealing spoons. Okay. So, whichever hotel, wherever she would go around the world, she had the tendency to take minimum of one spoon from the table. Okay. She, she had a huge collection. Okay. And because she was uh, a very well known cine actress therefore, uh, her name was never brought to limelight. No, no one would say that okay, why for why was just for a single spoon why to you know, say that you have stolen one spoon. So, you allow doing that. Uh, somebody from uh, one of the royals family from Europe also had this tendency okay. and because he was from the royal family and the case would might be blown out of proportion in the media. Therefore, he always was scotted by a secretary who would just keep following him. So, this man would you know, keep stealing things and that secretary will keep making a list of the objects which were stolen by the prince. Okay. And once the prince leaves out with his uh, cavalcade, this man will you know, make the payment at fine. Okay. So, that the fact that the prince is kleptomanic is not known to the rest of the world. Okay. So, this is kleptomania, okay. this is again a problem where you have difficulty containing your own impulse. Then we come to a very peculiar type of an impulse control disorder what is called as pyromania. Pyromania is uh, an uncontrolled desire in an individual to put things on fire. Okay. 
So, you just you know out of nothing you simply tend to keep some put something on fire and when it burns it you know you are extremely amused to look at it. Okay, usually you know it is very rare to find people uh, who would show this type of a tendency, but it is not that exceptional also. Okay, you will find people who derive pleasure out of setting things on fire, okay, something and then immediately you set that object on fire and you derive pleasure out of it. Maladaptive gambling of course, is uh, another interesting uh, feature where uh, you, know, you go for gambling to the pathological extent. Sometime back we had an invited lecture where only 7 8 of you had come. Uh, there was a whole one hour long lecture on pathological gambling. And then we come to another type of impulse control disorder what is called as uh, trichotillomania. Here an individual okay, will just you know coil the finger around the hair and pull it out. Okay. So, you derive gratification out of pulling out your own hairs no? and this is an impulse no? you cannot control. So, you just do like this and then you pluck one hair another third and keep on keep on doing that and usually if you look at the scalp of uh, people suffering from this you will find that they have very minimal hairs no? and there would be no wounds of plucking the hairs okay? because they keep on keep on doing. Now onwards what we will do primarily we have understood know the uh, five different types of uh, impulse control disorders. Okay. Uh, now what we would do is that we would take the first three and exactly look at the diagnostic criteria for that. Okay. Remember that these are the diag diagnostic criteria which has exactly been taken from the DSM 4 TR. Okay. We first come to intermittent explosive disorder. Okay. A several discrete episodes of failure to resist aggressive impulse that results in serious assaultive acts or destruction of property. So, basically you have discrete episodes no? means one today another one tomorrow after a week 15 days 20 days. So, there are discrete episodes of the inability shown by the individual to have control over the aggressive impulse. Okay, and it has always resulted into certain forms of salt. Okay. Uh, you just come to the room 20 minutes after the class has commenced and then you come and you see somebody sitting on the chair where you sat one week back and suddenly you know you apply one punch you know that this is the chair where I sat last week. Okay. These are disproportionate type of reactions. Okay or you cause excessive damage oh it is so much of uh, you know uh, heat and this room seems to be a little stuffy why this is AC is not working and okay. you will find such type of episodes also being reported in many of the boarding schools. Okay. How many of you have been to boarding schools none oh. Then talk to your friends who have been into boarding schools. They'll tell you that usually it's uh, you know eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh. Uh, that's the usual stage when uh, you know uh, students in the boarding setup. They usually take pride in uh, you know committing damage to the property of their own boarding set, uh, school. Okay. Now such behavior usually do not qualify to be uh, intermittent explosive disorder because there are not frequent uh, episodes of it no? there are not uh, too many episodes of it. But even if you find somebody who has been doing it okay, whenever he or she has got this opportunity then it invites the care of a specialized. Okay. Then B the degree of aggressive expressed during the episode is grossly out of proportion to any precipitating uh, psychosocial stress. You know. So, your reaction will be disproportionate you know. somebody is taking a chair and if you shout if you hit the individual okay, all these are disproportionate reactions. The aggressive episodes are not better accounted for any another mental disorder. Now, there is a rider that you should not be actually suffering from any other type of mental disorder 
and are due to the direct physiological effect of a substance or a general medication condition. So, so say if you have been uh, intoxicated, if you have been uh, you know, given a drug which makes you much more impulsive, okay, then in that uh, you know, under the influence of that type of uh, uh, psychiatric disorder or substance uh, intake, if you commit such type of behavior then it is not considered to be intermittent explosive disorder. But if you are not a sufferer of a psychiatric disorder, if you are no, not suffering from a, a substance a abuse or induction of certain type of a, a chemicals in your body and still you, ha, you have a tendency of repeatedly you know, showing your inability to control your anger, where your reactions are disproportionate and you commit damage to the property of the individual or to the physical well being of the individual then it is considered as intermittent explosive disorder. We need to think uh, really you know because uh, you would find many such cases okay, where the individual concern has not been actually put to scrutiny uh, for diagnosis of what actually he or she is suffering from. We have repeatedly been taking example of uh, you know that uh, gang rape episode in Delhi last December. Okay. Even today morning I was listening to the 7 o'clock news and there was a news of somebody being gang raped in Delhi last night. Okay. Uh, I guess perhaps this weekend there was a crime bureau report suggesting that uh, uh, I do not remember the exact figures, but it was more than 100 percent increase in the crime against women in Delhi, okay. right from Eve teasing to rape everything was more than 100, 123 percent increase in something, 111 percent increase in something, but it was all was more than 100 percent increase. Okay. Now, when you catch hold of an individual of committing an act. Okay, uh, which uh, violates the acceptable code of conduct from the legal viewpoint, from the social viewpoint, from both the viewpoints. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, in our country such people are not subjected to a rigorous type of scrutiny, okay. clinical diagnosis which will tell you that fine you actually belong to this category and hence instead of getting punishment you should get a treatment. The reason I am saying this is that our uh, conviction rate has been lower in our country, conviction time has been very long 10 year, 12 years and then somebody is convicted. And after people have come out of the jail it has been realized that this most of them, most of them not all, but most of them commit same type of crime again in their life. Okay. This somehow uh, no, should make us rethink that is it that uh, the whole uh, system of giving punitive uh, no, uh, measures to others in terms of refraining from certain type of social acts, okay. you realize that it is actually not working. All you have been able to do is to segregate that individual or those set of individuals from the society for certain period of time. So, you put them behind the walls they are not uh, into the regular interaction with the society, but then once this time frame is over of the say whatever quantum of punishment was say 3 years, 5 years, 7 years, when you go back mingle with the main stream of the society after a certain time you once again repeat that act. Okay. This means that punitive measure are actually not worked. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, I would not go into the details of it, but if you are interested. Uh, read uh, about uh, you know, uh, reward and punishment in psychology, there is a whole lot of very rich literature on this, which primarily suggests that uh, punishment as a module will never be effective in terms of reforming you. Okay. And that is the reason say, uh, I do not know if you have seen the drivers here, when they drive in the city they drive uh, without the seat belts, because uh, here in this part of the country there is uh, no, in, no enforcement of this rule. No? When these taxi drivers take you to 
Lucknow, okay, throughout their highway they would be without their seat belts. Before a certain crossing uh, in Lucknow, they, all of them will suddenly you know, put the seat belt. And when you ask them why have you done this, you say nahi nahi, par chalan kat jata hai. Okay. This means that the usage of seat belt has nothing to do with your personal safety and security, it has to do with the fear. Okay. Psychological literature suggests that punishment works like this. And therefore, if you have immediate presence of the deterrent, the person will not commit the act, but in the absence the person will certainly commit that act, because he is guided by the force that you are putting there. In turn, if you convert it into uh, know, certain forms of uh, positive reinforcement, then you realize that it works like anything. You would still find people uh, driving in uh, places where the seat belt norm is not at all uh, followed. Somebody even for a shorter distance from uh, his main gate to the parking area, again he will you know use the seat belt and then only go. Okay. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, it makes sense for everybody at right from the smallest levels say for example, here where I have seen uh, some of you coming late by 10 minutes, 20 minutes throughout the semester. Okay. But I have never ever thought of saying that no, see the your watch what time are you coming to the class now, 50 percent of the uh, class time is over and then you are making an entry. Okay there is no point saying that according to me okay following this reward punishment model okay if you find it interesting okay people who find it interesting say right now we had uh, know this, uh, this kumbh mela in uh, I, uh, allahabad no? you would find uh, people who are 70 80 years old in this chilled uh, december winter no for the mag mela okay uh, they will uh, know, uh, go for a kalp wash, which is basically uh, staying for the one full month on the banks of the river Ganges, 4 o'clock in the morning before the sun rises, you take off your clothes, you go and take a holy dip. You are guided by certain things which you find very rewarding. Okay. Okay. Now, getting rid of the sin is so rewarding for you that you are able to pay any price that you uh, know have to pay for it. Coming late to the class, okay, you do not find it rewarding and therefore, you come late by 20 minutes or you decide only to come for mid seven and seven, which is fantastic. Okay. So, in terms of containing such type of intermittent explosive disorder also, there is a need where you need to actually filter out that was this a single episode, because law will not look at whether it was a single episode or repeated episode. One single episode if you are caught then there is a defined uh, quantum of punishment, you will have to suffer the brunt of it. But then is there a way of you know, uh, going for a long term handling of such problems, as of now we do not have that. We go to uh, kleptomania. Okay, here there is a recurrent uh, failure to resist impulses to steal objects that are not needed for personal use or for monetary value. So, you are not going to use that spoon, you are not going to sell it off. Okay. Increasing sense of tension immediately before committing the theft. So, have you have extreme degree of uh, know, uh, tension within you and once you are you know, doing that act you have a sense of pleasure and gratification great degree of relief, when not after, but at the time of committing. Okay. The stealing is not committed to express anger or vengeance and is not in response to any delusion or hallucination. No? So, in your full sane state of mind, you have a tension which uh, rises within you, you commit the act and commitment of the act is pleasurable. Remember usually for most of the things for most of us post act is more gratifying. Okay. Say pre act there is a tension which is true for most of the things, peri act peri means during the commitment of the act the tension is still there, but actual gratification comes after the act is completed. In case of uh, kleptomania you realize 
that gratification and pleasure comes while you are committing the act and therefore, you feel more and more com repeating the same act. Okay. And of course, this is stealing the rider is that this stealing is not better accounted for by any conduct disorder, manic episode or antisocial personality disorder. So, if you are an antisocial a psychopath, if you have a conduct disorder, conduct disorder is basically your inability to comply to norms. Okay. And if you have uh, been the sufferer of manic episodes, if you are suffering from any of these things, then you cannot be classified as kleptomanic. And then we come to the last one that is pyromania. Okay, there is a deliberate and purposeful fire setting on more than one occasion. Tension or affective arousal before that, so tension is there okay, before you put the thing on fire. Fascination with interest in, curiosity about or attraction to fire and its situational context. So, in what type of situation are you putting things on fire? Uh, a repeated episode you will find some type of uh, unrest, people shouting slogans and one very, very small subset of that crowd, which will deliberately try to put the police vehicle on fire. Okay. So, that situational context in which you, you know perform your act gives you extreme degree of pleasure pleasure gratification or relief when setting fire and when witnessing or participating in its aftermath. Okay. So, while you commit that act, you, uh, you derive gratification out of it, you derive pleasure out of it. Once the act is over, when you look at the aftermath of it, oh great, this whole building, you know, how beautifully it has burned, you know, everything has collapsed, rubbles, fume, you know, ashes all those things you still find it gratifying. For normal people, you, know, you feel very sorry about it. The fire setting is not done for monetary gain, the rider here, as an expression of socio-political ideology or to conceal criminal activity, to express anger or vengeance, improve one's living circumstances. So, basically you have the full, full set of riders here that you should not actually be uh, under uh, the influence of these conditions, the E and F. Okay. These riders should not be there, then only your act qualifies to be considered as an act of pyromania. Uh, again I would say that uh, most of uh, the violence that you would see, okay, because people are not tested for whether they are pyromanic or not and therefore, they are all clustered as mob behavior. So, when you face the court of law, it said that no, no, this thing happened and then uh, this group of uh, you know, students were uh, uh, caught by the police force when they were putting certain things on fire. Okay. Uh, but I am sure if you really make all of them undergo clinical investigation, a small set will still be qualifying for pyromania. Okay. And we then we come to one of the slide which we had seen earlier when uh, we were we initially started our discussion on uh, aggressive behavior, that there could be situations where aggression is inwardly directed you know, and therefore, the entire destructive aggressive behavior that you usually see, which is usually uh, you know, inflicted on others, there could be a possibility when that aggressive behavior, the whole destructive tendency in that aggressive act is inflicted on the self. The image that you see here is of a Tibetan student in New Delhi, okay. uh, when a Chinese delegate was supposed to come to India. Okay. There was a massive protest by the Tibetan community here in Delhi and uh, all out of a sudden this boy suddenly had uh, put himself on fire. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, he was brought to the hospital with 84 percent burn most probably and in next 3 days he finally succumbed to his injuries, he died. But imagine a situation when somebody would decide to show that manifest that entire aggression on one own self. Okay. Uh, 
the common ones that you can uh, see at times it is not very common, but usually in a larger population you will find a small number doing that. Uh, I am repeating that example now, uh, you smoke cigarette and then you hurt yourself with the cigarette bud. Okay. This is once again a self destructive behavior, okay. when you finally decide to self emulate yourself, you know the consequence. Okay. Once the consequence is known, now paromania is fine, you are at least putting something else on fire, okay. but you know finally what this fire will lead to, the consequence is known to you, the aftermath is known to you. Here you know the consequence and still that act of aggression, that extreme sense of destructiveness is inflicted on one own self. Okay. Uh, so, this was all about the aggressive behavior.